time has come to begin. I've kept you waiting long enough. Let's dive into a close read and analysis of Metal Gear Solid 5. MGS5 opens on a static, low-angle shot. Though reminiscent of the home screen for PT, it feels nothing like Metal Gear Solid. Every MGS game before V begins roughly the same way, sweeping high-angle shots of the area of operations, in typical Hollywood action movie style, juxtaposed with a mission brief voiceover. The pattern is so integral to MGS orthodoxy that each act of MGS4 begins with its own variation. The opening shot is motionless, confined, and most unorthodox of all, it's in a POV first-person perspective. It's facing downward at the least interesting and uncinematic angle and shot possible. There's no framing, no sense of staging. Nothing Hollywood about it. But then, in total contradiction with the realism surrounding him, the man we come to call Skullface makes a theatrical entrance stage left, and under a spotlight, no less. As we'll come to see, Skullface is a figure of many ironies. Even this play-like entrance is ironic, since in a reversal of the classic Act V Scene 1 of Hamlet, tonight's monologue will be from, not to, a skull. A stage light also hints that no matter what you call it, tonight's events will also be something of a performance, a ruse. A game where we, like this man called Skullface, still have roles to play. This is the first case of a phantom spotlight we'll see, lights which aren't possible given the layout of the old prison area. The only spotlights we see in person I've marked here. The first phantom light based on its path would have to be here. I'll continue to point these out as we go on. A figure crosses directly in front, the camera angle obscuring his face. Within four seconds, we are inside the memory of MGS2's tanker mission. It's in the rain, the marines with green ponchos, and of course, the stranger in western wear. Yet the rocky beach, the ecology, the rain, and the sign all conjure up memories of Peace Walker's opening as well. This is just the beginning of MGS5's many synthetic combinations of what, on paper anyway, should not mix. As he moves down left to head off screen, the camera pans up as if to expose his face. But we're too late to catch him, just as Snake will be when he arrives momentarily. Twenty-three seconds in, we get our first look at the figure's fleshy, wrinkled face. What's left of it, anyway. It's here the memory of MGS shrivels and dies, like a dream recognizing itself as a nightmare or a ghost recognizing itself as a phantom. Western wear or no, this is not Ocelot, not one we recognize. It's his corpse-like doppelganger instead, a stand-in, a decoy, nothing but the painful phantasm of Ocelot's memory. Note the irony. Ocelot impersonates dead souls, whereas this is a dead soul impersonating Ocelot. This sign in Spanish is odd. What kind of max security facility is this? It translates roughly to, we may use lethal force on intruders if necessary. What kind of jail has to worry about people breaking in? This is yet another ironic reversal, another case of things being the absolute inverse of what they ought to be. This shot makes unambiguous Ground Zero's stylistic similarity with Hitchcock's Rope. We'll discuss the film's relevance later. We're herded into this holding pen like livestock, and in a subtle nod to Silent Hill 2, the camera angle makes ambiguous whether or not we are the ones being imprisoned here. 
The XOF space helmet hits us with a wave of nostalgia. It reminds us, much like the nine stars on the Camp Omega sign, of the police knot's astronaut informant with the pseudonym Nine Stars. It also reminds us of the boss's days at NASA in the 50s, which were not the Omega but the Alpha, the beginning of her downfall. The warm glow, or halo, of bluish light coming from these higher-up lights bring even more nostalgia, this time, of MGS-1. As do the cargo container-shaped cages, except, like Skullface, these skeletal cells are empty, exposed, unmade phantoms that only resemble memories. Listen to the subtle but undeniable sound the full sight of Skullface's head makes. After which another impossible spotlight moves from foreground to back. This intense brightness makes it really ambiguous whether or not we're seeing through someone's actual eyes. Our POV has grown into the height of a man. It sways as if from steps. Have we assumed Skullface's vantage point? This close-up makes it feel like we're leering over this trooper's shoulder. We watch him, in effect, take the safety off. This is no rookie. <laughs> This murky reflection confirms it. We're currently inside Skullface, looking out through his eyes. Even scarier, it's now as though he's warped from Ocelot's Phantom to Big Boss's. The FOX patch and the suit and tie bring to mind the post-Snake Eater award ceremony. Skullface never looks more like skeletal remains than here with this awful smile. A smile suggesting he may be aware of our presence inside his head. It's probably why this XOF man can't bring himself to look directly at him. The spotlight gives the XOF man a skeletal look, very much like the X-Ray Snake promo. Expecting a unit patch? Not on these guys. This is a clear nod to the real-life, insignia-less, Special Operations Force, Delta Force. All of a sudden, we're back down to the height of a child. Has our point of view jumped from Skullface to Chico? Are we a parasite of perspectives? Our POV returns behind Skullface's leg, like a scared child with its parent. It's as if Skullface is the only thing in the world our POV trusts or understands. Yet, with the cowboy outfit, this shot brings to mind the signature holster close-up shots of those spaghetti westerns Ocelot's so famously fond of. The revolver, like the Ocelot, is missing. The juxtaposition of the XOF guy's real gun, with the gunslinger pose here, establishes that Skullface can have Chico killed on command. He doesn't need a real gun, because words can kill. In summary, nothing about what we see in MGS-5's opening minute of silence adheres to conceptual absolutes. Skullface is a synthesis of Big Boss and Ocelot. The setting is a synthesis of the openings of MGS-1, 2, and Peace Walker. Camp Omega is a synthesis of a military base, max security prison, POW camp, and zoo. Even the guards are like halfway prisoners in their total obedience and fear. It's here MGS-5 breaks its opening minute and 13 seconds of grave-like silence with a monologue. Note, it's not a plurality, a conversation, but a single voice of absolute power. A single language. No 
Chico hits play, seemingly triggering a massive stylistic shift. We jump from diegetic to non-diegetic sound. For 13 seconds, nothing seems real anymore but the song. Song credits appear in the signature style of a music video, adding to our impression of reality transforming into fantasy. This abrupt shift was foreshadowed moments earlier with the appearance of lens flares. <laughs> Kojima specifically attributes this effect to the style of J.J. Abrams, Hollywood movies, and music videos. But there are latent complications and paradoxes in this shift. Firstly, the song sounds slightly distorted and thin, like a bootlegged copy of a copy. It's a sonic body double, a forgery. Yet, the music video's credits undermine this impression. They create a context, a pretense to truth or authenticity. The second problem is that prior to this shift, MGS5 has exuded textbooked cinema verite style. Examples include its handheld single camera feel, its state as one long unbroken take, its playing out in real time, its lack of editing, and the subjective in the moment way its POV gets distracted, misses important shots, and moves about at its own whim. Cinema verite is a counter Hollywood genre. It's about going great lengths to avoid escapism and fantasy, to avoid imposing narrative where it doesn't already exist. It's a documentary style that's puritanically obsessed with realism, with showing something not in terms of absolute truth, but only as the filmmakers saw it themselves. So combining the two is something like heresy. It should be impossible. Note the V formation of rats who trail, as we do, behind Skullface. Not only does this tell us about the camp's unsanitary conditions, it's a visual joke and piece of foreshadowing. Skullface is the Pied Piper. Now it's rats, but soon it will be kids his tune lures out of town. Ironically though, both children are also rats, as in snitches. Lastly, the combination of rats and skulls can't help reminding us of the Black Death Plague, which spread through fleas on rats and killed 30 to 60 percent of all Europeans from 1346 to 1353. This foreshadows Skullface's diseased, mass murdering will. Here, we're given a direct shot of a phantom light. This helicopter's roar brings us back into diegetic sound. Our POV has been jarred out of its daydream. I'm only including this to be thorough, but here it goes. I seem to see a similar reddish glow in the eyes of both this guard and the snarling hound we passed just seconds earlier. We never see these dogs in game. Could it be the dog transformed into a person? In reference to David Bowie's album cover, Diamond Dogs? I can't say it's likely, but the resemblance is unsettling between their strangely blood-tinged eyes. Before moving forward, I need to say a few things about the song, Here's to You. In the original story idea for MGS4, Kojima has said things would have ended with Snake and Otacon being executed for crimes against the Patriot Society. Though the staff eventually convinced Kojima to end on a lighter note, the song he had in mind for the first ending's theme remained. Indeed, MGS4's final credits roll to a rather stately, elegant version of the song, as arranged by Harry Gregson Williams. One of MGS4's themes is the idea that every system of thought, patriot or otherwise, shares the same fatal flaw. 
Once formed into an ideology, every system can only ever repeat itself ad nauseum. In Signature Kojima's style, we saw this in MGS4's writing itself. The enemy unit name, along with each of their cryptonyms, were literal permutations off of MGS1's mimetic source code, as it were. Unit Fox Alive, aka the B&B Core, have names that intentionally feel auto-generated off a template, and not only because they're literally products of the Patriot AI system. It also is to get MGS4's point across. Systems inevitably repeat themselves because it's precisely what they're designed for, maintaining a pattern. Yet, the Omega symbol, much like Ground Zero's loading icon, are both broken circles. They somewhat remind us of the ancient Egyptian symbol, the Ouroboro, a snake eating itself. The break in the circle suggests a being or pattern that feeds off its own past to survive, that digests yesterday to keep alive tomorrow. In short, it suggests a pattern that breaks itself to remain timely or coherent, a reinvention or reverse evolution of the facts. In computer terms, it's the difference between conventional programming versus today's algorithmic machine learning, uh, programs designed to self-overwrite and update. Before Ground Zero's Here's to You was the closing song of the series, yet only minutes in, this history has changed, self-overwritten. Here's to You now coronates both the Omega and the Alpha of the main events of the series. As we cross back into a cinema verite heavy style, inexplicably, Here's to You comes too. Only when the vocals come in is it clear that Here's to You is still playing. But why is it still playing? It seems our jump back into diegetic sound brought fragments of Chico's psyche with us. It's like dream logic or psychedelic drugs, like we're in a brain with its own individual way of filling in blanks. Ten days ago, we got reports that Paz was still alive. As this conversation strikes up, we're back in Hollywood, rewarded with this traditional MGS-style voiceover. Will this gift, like Chico's, be given just to take something away? As the caravan hits the main road, as mentioned, we're treated to a traditional MGS briefing voiceover. But unlike tradition, we're also given an uncut version of the conversation on cassette. Ten days ago, we got reports that Paz was still alive. The first obvious question is, how do they differ? Well, to cut a long story short, the most relevant sense is in the disparity between record dates. The MGS pattern dictates the briefing voiceover chronologically occurs before or during the big opening infiltration scene. Ground Zeroes seems to follow this pattern until you check the briefing tapes. Ten days ago, we got reports that Paz was still alive. She survived. Briefing 4 takes place before Chico escapes. Now why does this matter? because it reveals MSF were in no hurry to snatch Paz. It also reveals that we can't trust this story to tell itself honestly. As audible in Brief 4, Snake and Kaz wanted to wait until after the nuclear inspection before attempting a rescue. We need her on our side. If not us, who else is gonna rescue that bitch? When do we do it? The inspection comes first. We'll deal with us afterwards. It's only after Chico is captured that MSF's hand is forced. Chico couldn't have gotten to Camp Omega without their help. Knowing Paz's location on the southern tip of Cuba and all, it's hard to believe they didn't knowingly send Chico right into Skullface's arms. What about Chico? He had a chance to stop Paz from hijacking Zeke and he blew it. He's carried that guilt ever since. Kid really did care about her. Chico, it's hard to say how he'll react. Have a man to call him out to Cuba. He shouldn't be here right now. Good idea. They haven't seen each other in a while. Little time with Big Sis and he'll forget all about you know who. Especially considering a second key discrepancy in the cassettes. Snake and Kaz say Chico is infiltrating via mountain climbing, 
but his earliest words on the Chico's tape set is made I made it ashore. ashore. I'm in Cuba. Security looks lighter than I thought. Why, for that matter, does Chico make tapes at all? In a way, he reminds me of the good old days of memory cards. It's like if he doesn't get a record down of his time here, it will have never existed. Chico's acting not like a rebellious runaway, but a dutiful and devoted soldier. Frankly, I can't deny the evidence suggests Chico was told rescuing Paz was an official mission. Nor can I deny that the timeline discrepancy seems contrived to conceal MSF's hand in Chico's detainment, torture, and eventual death. The similarities between MSF and XOF are actually quite astounding, as this deeply ironic sequence intimates. As Snake mutters, we're an army without a nation, for example, we see the squadron of XOF troopers silhouetted in the shadowy smoke. A large number of objects present on the camp's airfield area show back up on Mother Base during the fall, and XOF, it should be noted, is present both times. The beginning is the end, the alpha, and the omega, a synthesis of extremes. Right. Passes are only meant to suffer. It's hard to shake the idea that he's using the mirror purely for our sake. Skullface is saying to the audience so much here that the difference between FOX and XOF is a matter of perspective. If she's still alive, we need her on our side. Finally, the song transforms into fully non-diegetic sound. This is the real deal, not a bootleg or a warbled radio version. Yet the helicopter's blades can still be heard. As the song repeats its slogan, Here's to You, Skullface tips his hat as a tribute to the audience, though he has the cover story of simply putting his hat on. As the camera moves through these bodies, it's the first time our POV has proven its own incorporeality. Like a ghost or psychic projection, we can move through objects, physically and materially, we are blank, empty, zeros. The opening sequence climaxes with sharp silence and obvious homage to death. But Skullface, acting as Cypher's vengeful angel of death, goes beyond killing our avatar, Big Boss. In true Orwellian fashion, Big Boss is, quote, not only dead, but abolished, an unperson. Cypher keep the man physically alive while erasing his memory, Snake's mark on the world. This light is death. It kills off every trace of either XOF or Fox. This is Skullface saying, You shall not see triumph. We will not let you die. You'll have to watch as we erase all trace of you from history. From here on, the difference between XOF and FOX has collapsed. The faceless man has stolen your face. Here's to use meaning, then, was parasitized by Skullface's twisted rancor towards us. He used it to make a mockery of our hope to ever be free of his control, to mock the hope that, at least in death, our agony and suffering here will have meant something. Triumph, death, we won't be allowed either. 